in fact, have a particular conference that would separate out older persons from others in talking about ethical issues. Because you understand from the outset that by separating out, we can either be separating out for purposes of discrimination, for naming as other, their other, or we can be, in fact, separating out, making distinct, precisely for purposes of attending to the specifics of the population that we're focusing on. So we might attend to children, we might attend to the mentally ill, we might attend to the homeless. So you need to understand, for me, we're separating out a group like Tapestry and this project here in BC, and I really, when I saw the announcement that BC has a seniors advocate, I went, woohoo! hoo Every, this, is, this, is, this could be very good and needs to be replicated across the country. So let's position ourselves as we're separating out and focusing on ethical issues around older persons and respecting ethical imperatives in relationship to our care and response and empowerment of them as well as practical challenges in care and policy because we want to get some sense of exactly the uniqueness and diversity. So at least four things then I want to just highlight because we could be here the whole day just doing this lecture. First, it's really important before we go to the ethical considerations to root ourselves in the facts, whether that's the clinical facts of a, of a situation or the social facts. So let's just review the changing demographics to get a real sense of why attention to this population is not just important for the individuals but for policy. Second, let's look at some attitudinal issues in light of the changing demographics and in light of the changing advances in medicine and in our socioeconomic situation. So first, the demographic, the numbers themselves. Second, attitudes about the persons and about the numbers. Third, let's look at what I've come to call the ethically relevant features of aging. In other words, if we're going to try to be discerning about the ethical imperatives and practical challenges, we really have to be attentive, first, to what is a generic issue in terms of respecting other persons, respecting and empowering decision making, across everything. But for us to be effective, for you particularly with your special commitment to the elderly and aging, you've got to be really clear on the specifics. So here, let's look at what I have identified as some ethically relevant features. And then finally, from that, the demographics, attitudes, ethically relevant features, what then might be some health and social policy challenges. And I'm going to couch that particularly, if you have heard me speak of this before, in terms of intergenerational justice. Intergenerational justice. So this is not the seniors over against the young. This is not the middle-aged over against the elderly. This is a, a concept that, in fact, is essential to Canadian society and just respectful policy that we understand it's not them and us, it's us, and then respecting diversity in and between us. So let's go. Remember, 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 even though I'm going to look now a little bit at the issue of demographics and numbers, our focus is, is always persons. Our focus is always persons. We, we, we may have to do, and there are some of you whose challenge is really statistical or economic, it, you're, you're, you're crunching numbers. But we cannot move forward with an ethical understanding unless we're constantly aware that this is all about real, live persons who had real lives, who no matter what their state is at this point, particularly for those who are in great decline or for those who've lost their intellectual capacities and, and their relationship uh, skills, the, it's not a 92-year-old woman in her home or in room 42 of a nursing home. It's a real life person who was a nurse in World War II, who in fact was a grandmother that rescued two uh, orphaned grandchildren, who in fact was an equestrian of international acclaim. Just, let's remember, let's remember that we always have to root ourselves in this understanding of persons. But having done so, 
we know that what has happened in Western societies, and remember Canada is actually behind most of the countries in Western Europe in terms of these phenomena about aging. There are changing demographics, life expectancy for men is up, for women is always, remember we are the stronger sex. <clears throat> Those weaklings with the Y chromosome don't live as long. It's very interesting, I think, reflections on why that might be so other than biology. This is important. The, the life expectancy in Canada has increased 21 years since 1920. Now, no one in this room was born in 1920, I don't think. There may be a few in the nursing homes in the area, but, but I want you to know that is almost within the lifetime of the oldest people in this room. 21 years longer in that short period of time since the beginning of the 20th century. This is, you, you need, I mean, those of you who work with seniors, you know this, but society and even our socioeconomic and political leaders seem only to, th to understand the magnitude of the demographic shift when in fact somebody's asking them for more services. But as a social phenomenon, this is, this is, you have to get your head around what this means. Then, the fastest growing segment, in fact, the statistics I, I looked at two weeks ago when I, before I sent the slides in, it's, it's the, the fastest growing segment, so if we do deca decades, 65, 75, 75, 85, the fastest growing segment is 85 and over. It's a small population, but if you look at rate of increase, it's the fastest growing. Whoa. What, 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 what does this mean? So, and then we can go, go to my side, the pediatric OBGYN side. What's happening is in our Western society where the fertility rate is down. So pay attention to what that might mean. It means that we now have in Western society an inversion of what we call the population pyramid. That's a classic population pyramid. This would be throughout human history up until probably the mid-19th century. Tons and tons of babies born, tons and tons of babies die. Lit little children die. By the time they get to uh, at late adolescence, you see there's a bit of a stabilizing out, and then you see deaths. Large numbers of those deaths actually workplace accidents, right? Men out fishing, uh, loggers. Act. So, but what it meant is the traditional pyramid before modern science and technology and the advances in general health and well-being went like this, with a large middle-aged population in the middle, because it's the middle-aged folk who do the work, that pay the taxes, that allow us to have services to provide for the little ones and for the elders, right? This is, this is the way it was. This is the current developed nations pyramid. I'm sorry, this, I can't find one for Canada, but this is what it looks now. Ain't no pyramid no more. Look at actual fact because of the birth rate. It's not only that the base is not the widest, it's actually it's narrower now. It's narrower now. And then look at what's happened. In that traditional pyramid that was pyramidal, you had this sharp increase and almost a straight line up. Some people did live to be 100 or 102, but it was very small. Look, look at what we're seeing here now. And you're seeing, look at 80 plus, particularly on the female side, rapidly growing. So this is not a small matter because the way in which society has understood how we function, basically you're dependent when you're young, you work, you provide support, you're responsible for care of your elders in decline, but now what we've done is we've shifted the numbers and the support, including the deep problematic, I mean the sandwich generation of older women is a nice example, they're caring for both the, their grandchildren and an elderly spouse at home who may have uh, dementia. What I want you to think of now is what those numbers mean when we begin to think about it is that there has been an enormous shift, not only in the number and age of Canadian society, but in how we think of each other and how we think of aging. Let me just, let me just mention a few and then in the conversation we'll have back and forth. And I mean, I've looked at some of the amazing topics in the program. You'll be dealing with some of these in depth, but this becomes important. So you have the numbers, big number difference, and we're still grappling with what does that mean for social programming and, and for support. Then we have attitudes. Well, the first attitude is 
that of, you have successfully aged. Now, please understand, uh, I try to be fit. I try to, I've had breast cancer, but I didn't do anything to get breast cancer. It just happened. What I want you to understand is that while we, in fact, do need to promote healthy aging, promote for as long as we can health and well-being and activity, that we have a myth out there that can be very dangerous. That is, if you do all the right things, you will, in fact, be golfing at 92. And if you are 62 and you are dependent, not only with extra needs at home, but perhaps even in a long-term care nursing facility, you did something wrong. You did something. What was the matter with you? You must have done something wrong. It's the obverse of my experience as a pediatrician, right, being called to the delivery room. If you did everything right in the pregnancy, the baby has to come out perfect, right? We didn't drink. We took our vitamins. We exercised. No wine, right? Begin to understand that while it's important for us to advocate for health, that there, you can see that that can sneak in a certain kind of a discriminatory, judgmental approach that somehow or other, if you are increasingly dependent, that you have failed. So you are unsuccessful at aging. Just begin to think of some of the attitudinal things. And those of you who work in this area, will, you'll be able to fill in all kinds of blanks. But that one becomes important. The second general attitude I want you to think about is that of aging as a medical condition. Some of you may know there's a, a field called biogerontology. You know, and they're looking at these one-cell little organisms and seeing, could, could they replicate so that they'd live forever? I mean, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just too old and I don't want to live forever. <laughs> um, the interesting phenomena here, though, is not just that there's a biology, there is a biology of aging, and we have to understand it better. The point I'm trying to make is aging is not a disease. It is a process of human life. Being an older person is a state. It is not a medical condition. Old is not a diagnosis. And yet, at the, we have to begin to think of how, when we think of responses to the needs of older persons, we, we have a tremendous tendency to move into the medical fix orientation. And, and let's, let's hold, that, hold that thought when we look at the next slide. Oh, no, so the one after. So, so that's general attitudes. Then I wanted to general attitudes. So the first is towards aging, right? You got to do it successfully. If you're dependent, then you did it unsuccessfully. This is towards older persons. There is this tremendous, um, if I put you on the couch and I did a little Freudian analysis and I said, old people, what flashes in your mind? Well, what flashes in the mind of most unfortunately, is that of someone who is really old and dependent. There, that, that caring for elders in our society, with all of the cha our changes in our homes, we no longer have you know, three children living farm by farm by farm in Saskatchewan, and John, the eldest, is taking care of grandpa since mom died. And when John needs a break, his sister Susie, who's the farm next over, comes on over. It ain't like that no more. It ain't like that no more. I mean, in fact, one of the enormous, interesting, scary phenomena socially is that a huge number of our elderly are living alone, are living alone. We're going to look at that in terms of supports in a moment. But what it means then is there, because of the changes in structure, two, two adults working in a family, homes not able to sustain supporting elders the way they used to, part of the consciousness then can be older persons are a burden. Now, I assure you, when your mom was changing your diapers, it was no picnic. But in a certain kind of understanding of the natural way of interacting through life, the stages of life, we understood that's what you did to the little ones until they could take care of themselves. And then there comes a time at the other end of life. It's Disney captured it in the circle of life. <laughs> Though socially, we have a, an interesting phenomenon with it. Now, when this gets to be really problematic, it's in fact, when we see elder abuse. This is an, uh, this, remember I'm a pediatrician. I deal with child and sex abuse on the, on the pediatric side. It's a horrible thing. But a horrible thing that this happens to seniors. 
to elders. And it's everything from their sons and daughters ripping off their, their old age security checks and pension checks and, and taking their car. I mean, this is to, to, to beating, to physical. Some of it's irritation with the demands. Some of it's our social, just like with children, it's our social inability to provide the support that's necessary because some older persons, like some children, require lots of care. And the support for that is not in place. So general attitude then we have to be concerned about as we move forward is that older persons immediately, immediately are seen as dependent, burdensome, and then what happens is ageism. Ageism is, like racism and sexism, a distortion. Ageism sees once you have a number, so the number of your birth date, not who <laughs> you feel you, how old you are. Once you have that number, then in actual fact, I mean, people have tried this. Remember in Britain uh, 15 years ago, when there was huge issues with regard to dialysis facilities, they decided if you were 65 or older, you could not get on a dialysis list. Now, let me, let me just, in justice terms, I'm going to make a claim that you can be 42 and in such multiple com comorbidity state that you should not go on a dialysis list. And you can be 73 and you should go on a dialysis list. Because the situation isn't the number, the situation is attending to the particular circumstance. But we have this tremendous attitudinal problem uh, that we have to deal with. So on the one hand, we love to see the advertisements and the, success, the facelift so that you can look again as if you were 20 when you're actually 72, or, or the, the myths of successful aging. But, but there's an attitudinal thing here that we have to be concerned about. And this is where the attitude really gets scary. This is where it really gets scary. Because individual Canadians in their individual lives may or may not be dealing with the issue of responsibility for care for elders. I mean, it happens to all of us at some point. But at any given time, you're not necessarily dealing with your 92-year-old mom or your 83-year-old dad who's in a nursing home. But in Canadian society, remember I'm a healthcare ethicist. Justice and healthcare policy is a big thing for me. I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow night at St. Paul's for Newman UBC. The issue is the ordinary Canadian begins to be very attentive to all these old folks when there's a myth out there that they're the cause of the consumption of all the healthcare dollars. That means that you and I have to go on wait lists. The language in the economic literature about this is always catastrophic. It's either the avalanche of the elderly, and God knows you and BC know the tremendous devastation of an avalanche, right? Or the tsunami of the elderly. That's the other the metaphor that's used. And again, God knows, look, we've just seen a tsunami off the coast of Chile. We, we've seen it in the Philippines, right? Incredible devastation. And yet there's an image out there, oh my, what have we done? with all of these older people now eating up all the health care resources so that you and I are not able to have them. So there's some profound attitudinal things. And now let me just make this very, very clear. First, scapegoating the elderly for rising health care costs is wrong, 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 and unfair. Surely, there is a in slight increase as we get older for ordinary care and as you get older, you do have a likelihood of multiple morbidities and the like. And costs have improved despite age-specific health status generally improving. We have generally improved at all ages, in all uh, decade analysis, the health of older persons, generally better. There has been what's called then some compression of morbidity. You get older and, in fact, you have fewer years at end of life where, in fact, dependency, debility, and, and, and illness happens. On the other hand, because of advances in modern medicine, pay attention to this one, this is really important, we have increased exponentially chronic illness because modern medicine, contrary to popular opinion, does not mostly cure. Modern medicine, medicine has three goals, to cure when you can, to improve function, symptoms, quality of life, always, and to accompany the dying. Most people think you go to a doctor for a cure. Garbage, nonsense, not true. 
The kind of things that are cured, meaning totally fixed, are very few. You have a bad infection, I can cure that most of the time. You have a fracture and you can't walk, hey, we can, pin, we can make that look, look good. Most of modern medicine is we improve function, we improve quality of life. Let me give you the best example. Diabetes. Banting and Best, in the lab in Toronto, across from my office at Sick Kids, discovered insulin. Do you know from the medical side of things, there are people who say the discovery of insulin put back an understanding of diabetes by about 25 years. That sounds horrible. I'm not, I'm not, I, I want you to understand the point I'm making. Insulin did not cure diabetes. Insulin, in fact, helped persons. Thank God, some of you in this room, statistically, are living because of insulin. But the disease process of diabetes, with all its vascular complications, continued to progress, sometimes even with excellent diabetic control. A nice example. Let me do another example. That's not so we didn't cure it. We created persons who now lifelong have to attend to medical issues. Second one, transplantation. People believe if only she could get the kidney, if only he can get the heart, he'll be all better. Uh -uh -uh -uh. If you can get the kidney, please God, you go from being renal, in renal failure, to being lifelong immune suppressed. <laughs> you, go, you don't go from being in renal failure to now I'm healthy and well and I never have to go back to see the doctor again. So I, I want you to understand that part of what we're seeing in this rising cost issue, it, this is where it's the advances in modern medicine that have created the enormous category of chronic illness. What I really want you to pay attention to, however, while there is some increase in cost of ordinary care as we age, there is. It is not the exponential frightening numbers that you think. The reason for increased costs is the increased use of high cost technology as we age. But let me tell you, the increasing cost of high cost technology is the problem for the Canadian health system in general. Second renal transplant, people demanding a second heart, people demanding a uh, uh, left ventricular assisted device. After all, the congestive heart failure treatment doesn't work. After all that stuff, that technology doesn't work. Now put in this little machine until I can get a heart, assuming everybody's on the list for a heart. What's happened to us is that we not only use technology that can do good, thank God, but now we've in fact got to the situation we have persons with multi take diabetes, multiple comorbidities, uh, already have had two leg amputations, have diabetic retinopathy and cardiomyopathy, and now they're going into renal failure and people are wanting to put them on dialysis. Now this is not the situation of a basically healthy 72 year old for whom renal dialysis might in fact give them some kind of uh, benefit. What I described in that case was somebody whose diabetes is killing them. Multiple comorbidities, already the heart's gone, the eyes are gone, and why are we using dialysis? <laughs> we are using dialysis because our natural inclination now is use the machine. So it, it, it's, it's actually not life prolonging so much as it can become, as an ethical issue, death prolonging. We just stave off the technology. But the important, the important, the important issue for us now as we go in our final comments about ethically relevant issues the important issue is the, the costs with the elderly are for the same reasons as the cost with newborn babies, with 14-year-olds or 40-year-olds. It's how much high-cost technology, when do we in fact say, particularly in a system that has common resources, you've had your fair share. I'm not saying abandonment of care, or, but $60,000 for you to have this chemotherapeutic agent for your colon cancer after three years worth of treatment for colon cancer that has failed, $60,000 for the possibility of four to six weeks of more life, of dubious quality, may be worth it for you, but is it worth it for the $60,000 that won't be given 
to the rest of folks in British Columbia, because that's the trade-off. And because our mentality has become not this communal understanding, even in families, but rampant individualism, but, but, I, but you see what I'm saying? That don't let people do the tsunami of the aging as if it were the aging. It's not the aging. It's the way in which we're dealing with goals of care. And ha-ha, my good buddy. So now you, you take over when you get up here, Romaine, and do the goals of care issue. And getting people to really understand, on the one hand, we do not discriminate against an individual by reason of their age. On the other hand, we take into account carefully goals of care that, in fact, can bring benefit for those who are, in fact, aging. All right, so demographics have changed. I think there's a lot of attitudinal stuff that puts seniors at grave risk, and particularly grave ri risk when it comes to policy decisions. We'll see that at the end.